A year ago, the United States ended its most protracted conflict ever, Afghanistan. 12 months on, where does that decision and the execution of that evacuation leave American foreign policy and domestic politics? How might it dictate the US's approach to future interventions? And what does it mean for the legacy of this administration and the reputation of a nation once known as the world's policeman? To answer all that, we first have to go back more than two decades to a defining moment in modern American history. A few days after 9-11, George Bush set the scene for what would become America's longest war. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people... And the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Within weeks, America had launched the so-called War on Terror in Afghanistan. It was a country led, as it is now, by the Taliban. Militants the US accused of providing safe harbor to the Al-Qaeda masterminds of the September 11th attacks. For 20 years, the US military had a presence in Afghanistan. That is, until this time last year, when current President Joe Biden withdrew the final American troops but not without seeing considerable bloodshed and the Taliban returning to power. That should have never happened, and we need to understand why so that we can ensure that it never happens again. I'm Jesse Jensen. Jesse Jensen's been running for Congress in Washington state for the Republican Party. A former army ranger who served in Afghanistan for four tours, he set up Task Force Argo, an organization that helped rescue 3,000 Afghans and dozens of US citizens amid the turmoil. He claims miscalculations during the evacuation led to the deaths of US Marines in Kabul and undermined the military's efforts on the global stage. In June, his and other veteran groups wrote a letter to Congress's Foreign Affairs Committee demanding a transparent and robust investigation and a series of open hearings to find out the truth about what Republican lawmakers call a bungled investigation. The aim, they say, is to seek accountability and to give the American people the answers they deserve. I would argue that you can draw a straight line from Afghanistan to the war in Ukraine. Uh, when President Biden said, you know, a minor incursion into Ukraine will be met with a more measured response. Compare that to the guy on the bookshelf behind me, uh, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Uh, what kind of rhetoric are we looking at and what kind of leadership do we have? And I would argue, again, personally, that the Biden administration has been a confluence of bad ideas and bad leadership. Yet even those who, at the time of the withdrawal, insisted it was premature and regrettable think an investigation would not make a marked difference. And once you start to develop an image as a president who's making mistakes, um, it's sometimes hard to recover. Now, in Biden's defense, I think he's handled Ukraine pretty well. And I think that, that will, to some extent, supersede um, the mistake of pulling out of Afghanistan. However, th because the Ukraine war was not prevented, and that's mostly Putin's fault, not Biden's, but still, it's the reality. Gas prices are up, energy in general, food prices are up, we have inflation problems, the world feels chaotic, we haven't been as successful at dealing with COVID as we wished, and incumbents usually pay a price when there's a litany of grievances like that. And that's the crux of it. Afghanistan, according to analysts, catalyzed a precipitous decline in the president's approval ratings, which, whilst no longer driven by events last year, might still haunt Democrats trying to cling on to both houses of Congress in November's midterm elections. The alleged failures in Afghanistan have cast a shadow over Joe Biden's foreign policy agenda and America's standing in the world. Yet a missile strike this month in Kabul went some way to changing that. The killing of the leader of Al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahri, is a win for the White House, one that proves Washington remains focused on the region. When I ended our military mission in Afghanistan almost a year ago, I made the decision that after 20 years of war, the United States no longer needed thousands of boots on the ground in Afghanistan to protect America from terrorists who seek to do us harm. And I made a promise to the American people that we continue to conduct effective counterterrorism operations in Afghanistan and beyond. We've done just that. The move may have brought a degree of closure, though it doesn't mark the end of this conflict, nor others. So what advice can America follow to ensure history doesn't repeat itself? Very rarely are you going to get a clean win 
for either side that they're happy with afterwards. Normally speaking, some kind of compromise outcome is is what is, is the best that anyone can achieve. Um, and I think looking forward, the moral of that story is uh, negotiate for, plan for, and strategize around a political solution to the conflict way earlier than the United States normally does. Lessons the US needs to learn as it confronts the challenges posed by Russia and China, whilst also not taking its eyes off Afghanistan and the potential that country holds to once again become a threat to America's national security. The United Nations says Afghanistan is currently facing an economic, social, humanitarian and human rights crisis. And efforts by those here at the UN and other aid agencies to provide life-saving assistance to Afghan people has been substantially hampered since the Taliban takeover. We've taken a look at the challenges faced getting aid into the country. It's been a tumultuous year for Farzana Jamalzada, adjusting to life in the US. She arrived into the country on August 25th, 2021, several days after flying out of Kabul. We spoke with her after her first day working for a philanthropic group in New York that supports non-profits around the world. A year ago, she was in a position similar to those she now seeks to help. I had to leave my country within 10 minutes that my father-in-law called me and said that you have to leave. And I, I, I left everything behind, not even able to like say goodbye to my mom. And I just left everything with the clothes that I have on. Fazana worked with the US Agency for International Development and then the presidential palace in her native Afghanistan before the Taliban takeover. Many of her family members are still in Afghanistan. She says the whole country has regressed over the past year, and she says the worst impact has been on women and girls. Put yourself as a human that always being at home, isolated, it's tough, it's horrible. I mean, it's just depressing, it's just tough. It's just like, you just have to like, breathe and stay alive, that's it. You're not living, you're just alive. The Afghan economy has collapsed since the Taliban took power. The unemployment rate is on its way to hitting 40% this year. And the United Nations warns the poverty rate could reach 97% by the end of the year. And sending money home has gotten harder for Afghan expats. The Taliban's been largely cut off from the international banking system, with the US blocking its access to central bank reserves. Sami Zaman has run this Afghan restaurant in New York City's borough of Queens since 2016 and has lived in the U.S. for over 30 years. As he feeds hungry New Yorkers, his mother provides care for children in Afghanistan. With financial support from Sami, she's run an orphanage for three decades. She tells him security in the country has improved since the Taliban takeover, but people are struggling economically. He's now only able to send a few hundred dollars a month home. In Afghanistan, the banks are very tight with money. I heard that people were waiting for hours and hours and hours to get their money from Western Union or whatever these uh, organizations that, you know, people sending money. It was the people waiting in the lines to get their money, $100 or $200 or $50, whatever. It was very hard. And people are very suffering so much. These restrictions on the country's financial sector are hampering aid agencies' ability to work on the ground. According to the Norwegian Refugee Council, more than half the population now needs humanitarian assistance to survive, a 30% increase from last year. The question that I think needs to really be asked to the international community is how long can this continue? And what, and what happens next? What is the pathway forward in Afghanistan? Because NGOs, us, like humanitarian actors, what we provide here is a drop in the ocean compared to what the needs are. The United Nations reiterates that call for action from the international community. At the start of the year, the UN launched a $4.4 billion funding appeal for Afghanistan, the largest ever for a single nation. But as of early August, it was only 39% funded. With the war in Ukraine front and centre in the minds of much of the international community, some analysts believe the UN is limited in what it can achieve. Given the circumstances, 
Um, I, I don't see what else the UN can do beyond people in New York and Geneva and Paris and Tokyo um, keeping it on the agenda. UN officials say fighting for women's rights must be a top priority and, if successful, could play a critical part in transforming Afghanistan's economy. The erosion of women's rights has been one of the most notable aspects of the de facto administration to date. The UN mission is also concerned about the impunity with which members of the de facto authorities appear to have carried out human rights violations. Natural disasters have compounded the suffering for many Afghans in recent months. An earthquake in June killed over a thousand people. And recent flash floods are believed to have impacted more than 18,000 people. Aid groups are calling it an emergency on top of an emergency, as the need for humanitarian assistance continues to soar. On from their escape from Afghanistan, many Afghan refugees who made it to the US are still struggling to get their lives on track. Nearly 8,000 of them ended up here in this part of Northern Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C., according to resettlement agencies. But finding jobs and housing, learning English and navigating a complex asylum system is challenging, compounded by the isolation that many feel. I've been speaking to some of those who are trying to overcome those obstacles and to make a new home here. Whenever we go, for example, shopping. A year ago, English teacher Mohammed Youssef was hiding from the Taliban in his home in Kabul. I was totally scared because like I was studying at American University, I was working with them and then I was teaching an organ English for all the students. And we were like, what to do now? Will they kill us as they, they killed my brother? Or will they shoot me again as they shot, shot, shot me like before? After 15 days in hiding and terrified for his life, he was evacuated by US special ops. We thank uh, the American government, we, the resettlement agencies, like the, all the staffs, the, the, the special force, the army, everyone, they were very helpful. But the help only goes so far. Like most Afghan refugees, Mohammed Youssef was only given a two-year visa. We had to apply for asylum before one year ends. So I'm very like, if we don't get an asylum, will we stay here? or what, what will happen to our future? Where should we live? Because we, we, I, I, I would never go back to Afghanistan with the same people staying still there. While he waits for his asylum claim to go through the overwhelmed system made slower by the Trump administration's decimation of the immigration service, he's teaching his fellow refugees how to speak the language of their new home. With this job, I help the, the people, and this is the job that I loved in Afghanistan. Because if, uh, if they don't speak language, uh, uh, this language, they will, be like, they will be like locked in the house, locked in a jail. Though school's out for summer for American students, these classrooms are still open for Afghans. More than 50 students are enrolled for English lessons in this neighborhood alone. And it's all thanks to the work of local charities working with Alexandria Public Schools. Those charities say the demand for help is ongoing. Now the need seems almost limitless. We just got a new batch of uh, SIV, special immigrant visa, refugees here recently, so the federal government uh, through the, uh, uh, the Assistance Act and so on has provided uh, a lot of support. They take care of the you know, basic services. And so getting people into, if you will, civil society, into a community and a neighborhood, that takes, that takes people the grassroots to do that. One of those they've helped is Zahid. We've protected his identity as he used to work at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, and he fears for the safety of his family who remain there. It was the only option to leave the country, and 
I don't know. I can't say what will happen if I wasn't able to leave or make it to the out of Afghanistan. It was a traumatic departure, but he's determined to return one day. Because I couldn't see my uh, families, my cousin, my dad, even my brothers, and I even couldn't tell them uh, goodbye. So I know one day I'll be back. I know which way, but definitely, at least for doing something better for that country. Afghanistan's former finance minister, Khalid Payenda, was used to visiting Washington on government business. But now he's more likely to be taking people to high-level meetings as an Uber driver than attending them himself. Some of these monuments that you've, you've visited in a previous life and a previous role and now, you know, for example, driving somebody in Uber, it's... Um, it, it feels strange, you know, sometimes I feel it was a completely different lifetime uh, or it was some sort, of a, some, some sort of a dream. He's now concentrating on consultancy work, using his expertise on Afghanistan's economy and its politics, as well as trying to help those still trying to navigate the immigration system. I am in contact with some really good friends being, being in a limbo where you don't know how long you would be there is, is traumatic. You know, for some people, they don't know whether they would be processed, they would be returned. It's, it's, been, it's been tough. And he says it remains tough. There are a lot of liberties that I and my family enjoy in this country that I would not be able to do back home. But it's always traumatic, you know, and it's, it's been almost a year, but the trauma, you know, comes and goes. They say they no longer fear for their lives the way they did a year ago. But the trauma continues for thousands of Afghans as they process what's happened to them and what may become of them as they forge an uncertain future. Moscow and Afghanistan have a long and complicated relationship. From a Soviet invasion in 1979 to withdrawal 10 years later. With over 100,000 Afghans in Russia, that relationship continues to evolve, though largely now through business ties. The Kremlin sees this as a means to a stable Afghan economy, thereby reducing the threat of drugs and terrorism. Afghan Mir Vais Vial has been doing business in Russia since he graduated from university in Moscow in the early 2000s. He now manages multiple e-commerce businesses. He also helps new Afghan businesses in Russia get off the ground and lobbies to improve trade relations between Kabul and Moscow. Afghanistan that policy welcomes foreign investment, but it requires that entrance to the Afghan economy be partnered with an Afghan company. After a visit to Afghanistan to meet with its new Taliban officials, Mivais has become optimistic about the potential for a boost to Russia-Afghan business relations. Enthused by the prospect of a country not at war, he says he hopes Afghanistan can move on from uncertainty and instability to build a strong economy with significant international investment. As well as lowering barriers to trade, the last few months have seen Russia invite thousands of students from Afghanistan to study, both men and women. Mir Weiss believes they're the future for developing Afghan ties abroad, with many going on to become commercial business experts, like Walid Jalani, who recently graduated from a university here with a degree in international relations. He now manages an import business that uses Russia's fast and competitive digital commerce infrastructure. He hopes one day to bring that model back home to traders in Afghanistan. We are trying to somehow improve them, like just from a traditional business type to the online business. 
After determining what's in demand and finding the best deals, he buys goods from abroad, mostly China, and sells them to distributors in Russia. It's all organized online, something he'd like to see traders in Afghanistan do there. Back home, the, the country, the system, everything is very traditional, and everything has to be updated and upgraded to a level where we could we could apply all these uh, uh, latest technologies. For example, like if there is no law for online sales, you cannot make the online sales possible. Right? Right. With legislation that favors economic development, he says he doesn't mind who's in charge as long as the country's peaceful. With that, he believes Afghanistan can find a self-sufficient future. Last month, Russia struck a deal with the Taliban at the annual economic forum in St. Petersburg to cut all import taxes from Afghanistan, which traders in Moscow believe could mean more expensive imports like pomegranates and fresh figs become viable to sell in Russia. But while Russia's eager to take advantage of Kabul's fresh trade opportunities, it's wary of the country's traditional problems, including drug trafficking and terror networks. The Taliban has assured Russia it's dealing with these concerns, promising it will not export its revolution to neighboring countries and engaging with Russian-led attempts to halt drug trafficking. The Kremlin is also pushing for billions of US dollars in frozen funds to be released to the de facto Afghan government. With that money and a stable economy supported by foreign investment, including from Russia, the Kremlin believes Kabul can recover.